So we have Ajit coming in. Now, uh, lesser said, uh, I mean, I can't, I can't say much about Ajit. I have already told you who is uh, Ajit and what kind of uh, awe is he held in the industry. As far as uh, talking about uh, any subject relating remotely to investing is concerned. Please remember the basic thing on which he is going to talk about is overcoming your personal biases to win the investing game. Nobody holds us back more than us, us ourselves in realizing our dreams, especially the financial dreams. Ajit is one of the most sought after speakers in the financial industry and you are just about to discover why. When he speaks, words literally flow. Overcoming your personal biases to win the investing game is what he's going to tell you. Please listen to it very, very carefully. This might be one of the biggest takeaway from this summit. Over to you, Ajit. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Colonel. And, uh, uh, you know, welcome to everybody today. I hope that all of you can hear me clearly. I'd, uh, you know, simply like to uh, start uh, by uh, saying a big thank you to all of you for your service from all of my colleagues at uh, PGM India. It's a great honor to be part of this summit today and talking to you about investing biases. Uh, when uh, Colonel Govilla talked to me about this, um, I had an idea of putting the entire thought process around how to understand these issues related to biases from the army's point of view using a framework that the army is very familiar with and i'm uh, and i'm sure that it's going to be a pretty exciting presentation for all of you i know that uh, we have uh, a specific time to keep to and therefore i'm going to dive straight into my presentation uh, now and i want to start with uh, taking a leaf out of mythology the subject today is about biases the things that affect us in our decision making and uh, why some of those things happen and what are those things which are sometimes specific to investing. And the reason I take uh, this leaf out of mythology, one, it's a favorite subject of mine. But if we look at the classic story of Mahabharata, and if you read between the lines to think about how this affects us as human beings, then there is a very different story that we can get out of this. Let me quickly take you through that. We do know the story has... Dhritarashtra as the blind king. And this, in a very esoteric sense, is our brain. It is blind. And this blind brain of ours is influenced by many negative influences and various biases that we are talking about today. The hundred Kauravas represent those negative influences and biases. In fact, in the story of the Mahabharata, it is considered that anger is probably the one emotion that influences the brain negatively the most and Duryodhana is representative of anger and jealousy is the second and Dushasana is representative of jealousy. So just get the concept here, a blind king representative of the blind, blind brain, the hundred Kauravas which are nothing but negative influences and biases and if you want to defeat these negative influences here comes our heroes, the five Pandavas, which is nothing but our own five senses, the senses of sight, smell, hearing, touch, and taste. And that is the story that our ancient rishis built into this classic of trying to explain how it is. Of course, these five senses need to be working in tandem, working together, and what keeps them together is our passion. Draupadi is representative of that passion, and Krishna, of course, is the soul, uh, the charioter, the conscience as we speak. But what has been most fascinating for me is Karna, because Karna is one of the brothers, but he's on the opposite side and he is killed in the war. Karna represents ego. And much of what we face as issues in our personal and professional lives, many a times, many a times arises from ego and the egocentric biases that our brain is influenced with. And at some point, therefore, ego has to be controlled or killed if you have to actually win the war. So in summary, 
our brain is essentially blind and influenced by a hundred different negative emotions, influences, and biases. But the five senses, with the help of an able sarathi, can win over them. You have to either let go or kill your ego to win the ultimate war. I'm making this as a starting point, and I hope that you find this esoteric meaning of the Mahabharata interesting. But let me now dive into the subject of the day, which is about biases. And I am using the Zetkin bag, which is the army's mission planning tool. And I am hoping that all of you would be very familiar with this tool. With this tool, Kana Govila and I had a good chat about this as well. Of course, I need to give credit to Captain Raghu Raman, which, uh, who incidentally is a speaker uh, in today's summit. So that's uh, another coincidence that I'm so happy about that. As you know, he's been 11 years in the armed forces, 11 years in corporate life, currently the group president of Reliance Industries. And he's a very well-known speaker. And you find some excellent uh, you know, sessions uh, on YouTube. But you, know, you having him on the summit is fantastic. This is something that I remember listening to Captain Raghuraman when he was speaking to a bunch of us. It says that the army's lessons are written in blood because mistakes come back in body bags. So there is no scope for making a mistake. And therefore, the focus here, which I'm sure that all of you will understand, is the process of investing, the process of, um, of, of fixing the mission that you're at and no, making no mistakes there. And the Z-Kid Back framework is a good way. Of course, I have force-fitted a little bit of my concepts on investing biases to the Z-Kid Back, but I hope that you will find it interesting. So let's take a quick run through to the Z-Kid Back. We all know this. Uh, I'm sure that all of you know this. Uh, Z stands for Zamini Nishan, K for Khabar, which is the next tech information. Irada, Irada Pakka Hona Chahiye, and, and, and that's uh, central. And then you have Tarika, which is the strategy, Bandobast, all the resources, of course, administration, which is the metrics of measurement, and the last step, which is G, which is Ghadi Milao. So, Zamini Nishan, Khabar, Irada, Tarika, Bandobast, administration, and Ghadi, Mil Ghadi Milao, synchronizing with the commander uh, is, is the last step and an important step. And I, I'm going to use this framework to try and give you a sense of how you can approach the whole aspect of uh, investing and know what are the kind of negative influences and biases that we uh, are, are, are affected by and how can one overcome it or what is really that you can do to overcome those biases. So let's start with the first one. Zamini Nishan is the theater of war, the terrain that you're operating in, something that you need to familiarize yourself with. In, from, from my perspective for investors, we are operating in the Indian economy and politics, but we are also having an influence of the global economy. This is our Zamini Nishan for investments. The Indian economy and politics, which influences everything, our incomes, uh, our homes, um, and of course, but the global economy also plays a good part. As you can see in this pandemic, it's an issue that started globally and it's affecting everybody, including here in India. Now. Uh, yes, we understand this, that we are not buying the market, but we are buying individual businesses. It doesn't matter if it's a mutual fund, it's just a package of great businesses. And therefore, this for me is key, that we must keep our focus on the fact that we are buying individual businesses, even if it means that we are packaging it in the mutual funds that we buy. Politics definitely affects the economy in the short term, which is what is happening currently. Very difficult to predict things because new rules are being made almost every day, every hour, both globally and in India. But in the long term, economy dictates politics. In the short term, however, politics will rule uh, the economy and much of what we are seeing here today is because of that. So this is a little bit of what the Zamini Nishan is at this point of time. And the bias that people will tend to have when we look at the Zamini Nishan as the first step is the home bias, which means we typically tend to be very narrowly focused on what we know, Indian companies, Indian sectors, Indian businesses. But please remember that there is a global economy out there. Today, the Indian equity markets, for instance, is a little over $2 trillion, but the global equity market is $87 trillion. And why wouldn't you want to participate with 5 or 10 or 15%, depending on your risk appetite, in the global economy and find great businesses which are not listed 
in the Indian stock market. In this lockdown, for instance, me and my family, and I'm sure many of you, are binging on Netflix serials and Amazon Prime serials. These are stocks available on the international stock exchanges and not in India. And there are various such businesses which are growing and doing extremely well. So this bias, when it comes to the Zamini Nishan, is what one can take care of. The question to ask is, how narrow or wide is the scope of my investment? That's the question to ask and you'll get the right answer for this particular bias. Let's move to the second one, information, cover. And of course, in the, in the army's mission balance, it is not just cover about you know, your troops and your, the, your resources and bandobast and the terrain, it is also about the enemy. From an investor's perspective, of course, it is actionable intelligence as well that makes the most important part. Now here, I want to tell you that the enemy is inflation, volatility, and taxes. If I were to just, as I said, I'm force fitting some of this, but I hope that you will get the concept and it is useful. To me, if there is one single thing that defines understanding investments and how to go about it, what we need to understand is inflation. The one single anchor point to all the complicated stuff that happens around in investments. If one has a good sense about inflation and understanding it and how that affects other things, then one gets a pretty good idea of how to move forward. Now, as I mentioned, uh, why inflation? Because interest rates in an economy is connected to inflation. Higher inflation means there will be higher interest rates and vice versa. Higher interest rates is good for savers, but bad for businesses. And lower interest rates is bad for savers, but good for businesses. As simple as that. As we understand this particular relationship between inflation and interest rates, I think a lot of things from an information point of view, from a cover point of view, the starting point for me would be this, because this then allows you to take the right decisions. For instance, right now, interest rates are low, but with what's happening out in the markets, people are anxious and worried, and they want to take the money out of the markets and put it into bank deposits or savings products. But then, like I said, when it's low interest rates, it's bad for savers, but it's good for businesses. So one needs to be a little bit smart about that allocation as well. The bias, as far as cover is concerned, is herd behavior, which is just that you have so much information from all sources, especially if you are digital and all of us are digital, that we tend to think, that, hey, this is what everybody's saying. Sab hai, real estate is right now the best investment. I mean, I'm talking about eight or 10 years ago and everybody piles into real estate. At some point there is risk and there is fear and everybody says gold, 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 and you rush into gold or into equities. It is never one or the other, but I think if you are conscious of the fact that information can push you towards herd behavior, that's a good first step as well. So the question to ask here is, what is my framework for making quality decisions and not second guess that decision, even if that outcome is not in the range that you expected it to be? Did you take the decision and when you took that decision, did you have all the right uh, variables for taking that decision? And I think common sense plays a big part as far as this is concerned. So that's the second step, cover, of course. The next one is irada. Irada is uh, very simply, of course, we know it. It's the mission statement. It's the objective. From an investor's perspective, it is the goal. And you have short-term and long-term goals, the starting point of your financial plan. We must make sure that these goals are obviously uh, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. This is a, a, a formula that you know, HR managers sometimes use when they do appraisals and they set goals for people in companies. And the acronym here is SMART goals. S-M-A-R-T, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. If your goals don't fit into this definition, it's very likely that it's either unrealistic or unachievable. So one must take care of that in the irada. The bias that you might tend to have here is recency bias and a loss aversion bias. Recency bias explained by experts is the most recent big negative or positive news impacts your decision making. And it's very evident today that the recency bias that's playing through for all of us is 
Here's the pandemic. The whole world has got impacted. There's a shutdown. The economy has gone into doldrums. It's going to take a long time to get out. So that bias, that, that recency of this event is going to impact our decision making. But we need to keep focus on those short term and long term goals. And all we need to ask is how aligned are my priorities when it comes to my uh, goals. And therefore, if you have priorities which are coming up for maturity in the short term, you're going to retire in the next one or two years, or your child is going to study, go abroad to study in the next one or two years. Yes, then you need to start looking at what to be done, what is to be done uh, qualitatively in terms of, of the information you have and, and your investments are concerned. So that's the, the third step of Irada. Let's move on. Now it's Tarika, the strategy, the tactics. And to me, I think it's, it's about managing risk when it comes to investors. If returns are what we want and returns is one side of the coin, the other side of the coin is risk. Now, what is the tarika? What is the strategy? And what do we have to play the strategy? Please remember that we have different options. Life is all about choices, right? You have equity, you have debt or fixed income, you have gold or precious metals, you have other commodities, you have currency, you have real estate, and you would have heard a lot of people, especially ultra high net worth people talk about alternate investments like investing into paintings and sculptures and wine and what have you. But let's work with what we are most comfortable with. There are these different asset classes that are available to, for, for us in our strategy and asset allocation then between these asset classes is simply the key strategy that you work on. Downside protection has to be built into the tactics and that is best discussed as Sanjeev mentioned a little earlier, which is extremely specific to individuals and therefore a conversation with your advisor tends to bring out what is the downside protection that you require uh, in your portfolio how much conservative, moderate, or aggressive should you be? How much should you be spreading yourself out into these different buckets? Now, the bias that you might have in this step when you think about your strategy is just the perception of risk. We are human beings. We tend to overestimate and underestimate probabilities of our bets. Just the information. We tend to simplify and dumb down what we know, and then we take a decision in the moment and we tend to think that equity is bad or good or that gold is bad or good or real estate is bad or good. So the perceptions that we have of risk will play through when we think about strategy. And the simple way to approach this is just to keep asking the question, how diversified is my portfolio? The old grandmother's tale of don't put your, all your eggs in one basket is, as I mentioned again, the commonsensical strategy that one follows when it comes to your investments. And in almost all cases and experiences that I've come through, people who are well diversified are less anxious. People who are less diversified are more anxious. A simple example would be that today in the general civilian population all across uh, the country or the globe, a household that has multiple incomes is less anxious compared to a household where there is one single breadwinner and one doesn't know how the economy is going to affect his or her job uh, and, th and therefore there is more anxiousness. So multiplicity of income diversification is the key strategy. Let's come to the next step, Bandobast, which is all our resources. What is the buffers that we have? And here, of course, from an investor's perspective, you have a lot of, you have to think about it from a holistic point of view and a holistic options. You have mutual funds, you have insurance, you have loans, you have pensions, you have a will to think about. These are all the resources that you have to diversify and construct your, you know, your plan for yourself. And I do think that in this step, a sequence is important. When I say sequence, it means that protection comes first, savings and an emergency funding comes second, investments comes third, tax, wealth transfer, and all of those aspects come forth. Today in India, out of our 1.3 billion population, it is a little sad, but we all know that if you're earning even 25,000 rupees a month today, you are in the top 5% of the income uh, bracket or earners in the country. More than 50% of people in our country earn approximately 5,000 rupees a month. Why I'm saying that is because 
investments only starts when people start having a surplus. Before you have a surplus, you need to start thinking about protecting yourself and your income and your liabilities, which is why insurance, the protection step is always first. And the moment you start having uh, income, and I'm talking to the young people who might be starting off a job, uh, then you start building your emergency fund, which is your savings. And then you start looking at investments and managing your tax and wealth. Don't be too obsessed about tax right up front. It is a step that comes later. So sequence is important. I think the, the, the bias that might affect us in this particular step is that we get captivated by stories. A lot of times the poor decision making is because we allocate our resources based on some compelling story. And I, again, I think it's very commonsensical when I think about real estate as an example, five or seven years ago, everybody's piling onto it. There's this compelling story about capital gains that people are making. Uh, or, or if it comes to uh, you know, some sort of a fancy medical insurance, which you may not even require, uh, that you might end up taking, which is really not optimal. So be aware of this bias as well, that you could get captivated by stories. And I think the way to, to think about it is to ask that question as to whether something is really influencing that decision. Uh, what is the story that is influencing my decision? Is it logical? Is it, is it something that applies to me or does not apply to me necessarily? Now we come to the next step, which is administration. Uh, administration is, of course, the metrics of measurement, monitoring uh, the whole sequence of the mission, and um, I think it's just uh, simple enough for an investor to think about the frequency of review of your investments here. The critical thing from an investor's point of view, I think here, is to think about what is your benchmark? What is your personal benchmark? What is your time to goal? Uh, those are two things which are important. A, a simple bank FD could be uh, something which is, which is uh, a, a benchmark. Uh, you know, the nominal growth of a country's economy could be a benchmark. When I say nominal growth, just to explain that further, it's just the basic growth of the economy plus inflation. That is the nominal growth because mostly investments tend to be measured against this particular aspect by experts, which is the nominal growth of an economy. If India is, and I know that it's not going to grow, India is not going to do too well this year, and maybe you know, next year and the year after we will slowly recover. But if you were to just take an example and say an economy is growing at about five or 6% and the inflation is about 4%, then nine or 10% becomes the nominal growth rate of the economy, which means that everything in this economy, every kind of company on average is growing at this rate. And therefore, fund managers and investors need to expect a return slightly higher than that when you're taking the trouble of taking risk and investing. But the benchmark and time to goal is the step in uh, here when it comes to administration. Measure your own individual inflation. I did say that this is the anchor point for everything. If you have a household where you have a couple of members who have medical issues, medical uh, inflation is high. If you are a household who have young children who are looking to study further, especially study abroad, or even in India for that matter, educational inflation is high. So therefore, all of these would be part of your discussions when you talk to your advisor. What is the bias that you should be uh, looking for in this particular step? The bias that you should be looking for is result orientation. All of these biases are normal human biases. Result orientation, orientation simply means that you have a propensity to judge a decision only by the end result. Okay, the pandemic has happened, but my portfolio is down 14% or 18%. And you, know, you just look at that end result. And, and the quality of decision making, as I said, is the question to ask. Did I have, did I have my short term and long term goals planned out? Did I have the information that I required to make these decisions that I did? Did I diversify? Did I have the right asset allocation strategy? Is the downside protection built into it? Don't worry about just judging things by the end result. Be aware of these biases. That's the only simple point here. We are now on the last step, which is Gadi Milau, which is nothing but synchronize. Uh, synchronize with your commander. From my perspective, as I said, this is more about being disciplined. Since I'm force-fitting some of in, you know, the typical biases that we face as investors into this format of the Z-Kid bag, please allow me some of these liberties that I'm taking. Um, uh, I believe that you know, in synchronization, 
you know, it is good to have a trusted third party to guide you. Um, um, I have a 26 year career, 20 of that has been in mutual funds alone, currently the CEO of uh, the largest American brand, which is Prudential here in India. But my money is managed by my advisor. Uh, you know, 10, 15, 10, 12 years ago, I had a good advisor like Colonel here in Bombay and he manages my money and I trust them. Uh, and I've done my due diligence to say that I have a financial plan that I'm working with. Money is extremely emotional and money decision tends to become emotional. And therefore you need a qualified, credible, competent third party that you can trust to guide you on those decisions. You must navigate with the help of your North Star. Um, it is your common sense. It is your advisor, all of that rolled into one. I do think that in this last final step, the bias that we all have is overconfidence, which is the belief that we know how to control the market and that you know the market is essentially random, at least in the short term. So it is the process that is the king. I think that here I would say, how synchronized am I with my advisor? I would add that in a household, the husband and wife in the family needs to be synchronized uh, with the plan that we put together. It's always good to involve everybody into the plan rather than one person taking the decision. You will definitely have better outcomes uh, in, in that way. So uh, let me give you a quick summary of what we did and then we can open up for questions. Um, what was the domain? Zamini, Nishan, your terrain, cover, your information, Irada, your goal, Tarika, your strategy, Bandobast, your resources, administration, how you review, and Ghadi Milao, your discipline. The challenges that you will have is in your terrain, in the Zamini, Nishan, is home bias and widen your scope. That's the simple approach to take. As far as information is concerned, you will tend to have the bias of herd behavior and chasing returns. Please question the quality of your framework of decision making and the kind of information that you use. As far as your goals are concerned, you will have a recency bias that might affect it. Just simply make sure that you're well prioritized on your goals. Your strategy will be affected by the perception of risk that you individually have. You might end up oversimplifying too many things. It's just a human bias. Diversification is the simple approach to follow there. In Bandobast, your resources, please remember that the story will captivate you, uh, that you read in the paper or you hear somewhere, it will always captivate you and you might end up wrong resourcing. Just make sure that your sequence is right. It's protection, savings, investments, tax and wealth transfer. Just keep the sequence and you should be fine. When it comes to your review, you will be biased by your result orientation and reacting to what's happening in the short term. My idea, my, my thought process here is, and it might work differently for different people, simply review your plan twice a year. If the quality of your decision making was fine in the first place, and of course you can you know, keep revisiting it, just make sure that you're reviewing it twice a year. When you have a difficult, challenging time like this, no harm in reviewing thrice a year or four times a year. It doesn't matter, but it doesn't have to be done every year. The last step, of course, is Kari Milau. And here, I believe that you, know, you would end up being a little overconfident. We're trying to control randomness here. No expert really knows where things are headed. You have to just use your common sense to synchronize with your plan, with your advisor, and it should be good to go. Now, I know that when we talk about the Z-Kid bag, and that's a mission planning framework, and it's a plan that you can put together for your investments, it is the army itself that says that the battle plan is the first casualty of war. So don't be too rigid on the plan. Uh, keep some flexibilities in the plan when you discuss with your advisors. Let me tell you that if you want to just keep it simple, spend less than you earn, save the difference, take the help of a trusted advisor to put it into a diversified portfolio and have patience. There is no other formula, according to me, to make money. But step number one and step number four are very difficult. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you know, all of us experts and, and industry watchers have this habit of throwing quotes at people. So please indulge me with my favorite one. People do not decide their futures. They decide their habits and their habits decide their futures. So the routine that you have, uh, that you put together, you know, this is a simple framework that you can possibly use for this. Colonel, I'm done with my presentation. I hope that I've kept more or less to time with a little bit of the overrun. Happy to take questions. Uh, please go ahead uh, and thank you so much.
Okay, great, great. It was it was a great presentation. I'll talk about it. Can you hear me? I can hear you very clearly. Okay. So uh, the uh, question which has come through our Facebook Live channel: uh, Are the predicted growth gold prices of seven fifty five thousand indicative of the fact that equity markets have more? And I'll add much much more pains left or not. <laughs> so let me talk about the bias here. We get captivated by these stories. And uh, I think that, you know, uh, no expert can give an answer as to whether gold will actually go to 75,000. Uh, nobody knew that oil could possibly go to zero and bounce back at some point of time. Uh, nobody uh, can actually predict those, uh, those uh, particular points. I think the way to approach something like this is that, uh, and my experience says, everything is cyclical whether it is interest rates, whether it is inflation, whether it is the, therefore equity markets, gold, all of them are impacted uh, in a cyclical manner. What goes up must come down. What comes down must go up. So you are going to keep seeing volatility in equity markets. And that does mean that yes, equity will go through pains, but that's a natural process. It's not got something to do specifically only with what's happening right now. It is the nature of markets to be cyclical. Uh, my advice here would be, please approach this again by understanding that there is this bias of being captivated by a story. The way to overcome that bias is simply be diversified. Of course, invest in gold uh, and don't have zero allocation to gold. And I don't mean just gold jewelry, which is also fine uh, because you can hit two birds with one stone. You keep the family happy and you also have investment in gold. But then, you know, it's not the most optimal way to do it. There are gold bonds and things like that that you can invest in. So my simple point would be have some allocation to gold that fits you, but have your allocations in equity as well. Uh, Prudential, which is the 10th largest asset manager in the world, one of the things that they have taken, seen over the last 140 years that they've been in business is that when economies get impacted very, very deeply, like it is getting impacted right now, human ingenuity and human innovation peaks in the next three to five years in every sector. You will see new processes, new business models, new products, new, pro you know, new services that already you will see that people do to take, uh, you know, to take charge of this crisis and get out of this crisis. The only way that you can leverage and benefit from these innovations that happen in the next three, five years is in the equity market not in any other asset class. You can't do that in commodities or real estate or gold or anything like that. Companies that make new products, new services, new payment systems, new chemicals, new vaccines, they will, their share prices will benefit uh, if they are good companies, of course. And therefore, uh, equity is an important asset class uh, when you think about it that way. So you can't say one or the other, simply be diversified. Okay, uh, great, great. Fabulous. Uh, the second uh, question that has come uh, on, on the Q&A uh, uh, box is, what is meant by portfolio revising? What is the frequency and how to achieve, achieve it? You spoke about uh, revising, looking at your portfolio uh, twice in a year, which of course we as a company also do for our, uh, our investors. So uh, Kamal Sharma wants to know what exactly is this? Uh, Mr. Sharma, rebalancing is a part and parcel of managing your financial plan, rebalancing your portfolio from time to time. There is a lot of stories out there, again, which you will be captivated with this, which is, uh, uh, buy, uh, you know, fill it, shut it, forget it, which is buy, hold, and just sit on it for a very long time. Uh, this long term, according to me, is, is a misnomer. Uh, in the long term, we are all dead. Uh, so in the, you know, we have to be thinking about our short term goals and our long term goals. If you remember the step that I talked about and when you have your goals, uh, you know, you will need to do only a, a higher frequency of review when a certain goal is expected to come up 12 months, uh, you know, in the future. So for instance, if you're expected to retire 12 months from now, you must be doing a slightly higher frequency of review in your portfolio uh, today, 12 months before that. If your children are going to go abroad uh, and therefore those payments will come up or you're gonna start a business you know, a year out or so, you must be reviewing portfolios earlier and you can do it three or four times a year uh, just to make sure that everything is in track. But if not, if you're, if you're comfortable with your goals, you know that most of your goals, you're, you know, it, it's a normal situation and you know, your goals are coming three years out and five years out. 
I don't think that you need to review it too frequently. What you need to do is the first due diligence, that you trust your advisor, that, that he or she and the firm is competent, has the resources, has the experience, has the credibility, uh, uh, and which you are comfortable with, that you know, they understand, empathize uh, you know, your aspirations and goals, and the process that they follow is robust. If you understand the process, uh, just like we understand the ZK back process, if you understand the process and you're comfortable with it, I don't think it's required to review your portfolio too many times. Maybe once or twice a year, look at the portfolio. If you think that certain uh, parts of that portfolio is either not doing well or doing too well, rebalance your portfolio back to what the plan was. So sticking to the plan, I think, is the key. You need to rebalance to stick to your plan. As simple as that. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Ajit. Thank you, Colonel. It was a fabulous rendition and uh, exactly as uh, we all had expected that you will come up with something which will keep us glued and you come up with Zedkit back, which, you know, <laughs> many, many years back we used to do it. Of course, uh, Afoji has given it to you, Captain Raghu Raman. That's We're right. Really thankful to you. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I'm very sure we all have huge takeaways from here. Great. It's my it's my honor, Colonel, and Jay. Jay.